Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achano and welcome back to my C++ series. I don't know what this hand stuff is. Today we're going to be talking all about how you should be creating your objects in C++ because C++ gives us a few different ways we can actually create an object. Now, if you don't know what an object is or what a class is, you definitely want to check out the video that I made on that. There'll be a card on the screen or a link in the description below. But basically, when we've written a class and it comes time for us to actually start using the class that we've created, we need to instantiate it, usually. Unless it's like completely static, but we're not talking about that. We need to instantiate our class. How do we do it? We basically have two choices here and the difference between the choices is where the memory comes from, which memory we're actually going to be creating our object in. When we create an object in C++, it needs to occupy some memory. Even if we write a class that is completely empty, no members, no class members or nothing like that, it has to, it has to occupy at least one byte of memory. But that's usually not the case. We have a lot of members in our classes and they need to be stored somewhere. When we decide I'm gonna start using this object, I'm gonna create a bunch of variables, the object has a bunch of variables, we need to allocate memory somewhere in our computer so that we can actually remember what what, what the variables are set to. And our application is kind of divided into two main sections of memory, the stack and the heap. Now, there are other sections of memory, such as the area where all of our source code lives, or well, by this point, it's machine code. So those other sections of memory, we're gonna talk about them later. They don't really matter right now. Just think of it as the stack and the heap. That's all we care about right now. I am going to make an in-depth video about what the stack is and what the heap is and the stack versus the heap and all that stuff. If I've already made it when you're watching this video, there'll be a card there. If not, it's coming soon, so just hold on tight. In C++, we get to choose where it goes, whether our object gets created on the stack or on the heap, and they kind of have different functional differences. Stack objects, for example, have an automatic lifespan, right? Their lifetime is actually controlled by the scope that they're declared in. As soon as you, as soon as that variable goes out of scope, that's it. They're, the memory's free because when that scope ends, the stack pops and anything that was in that in that scope frame, in that stack frame, that gets that gets freed. Now the heap is is different. The heap is this big, big, big mysterious place where once you've allocated an object in that heap and you've actually created an object on the heap, it's gonna sit there until you decide, I, I no longer need it, I wanna free that object, do whatever you like with that memory. So let's take a look at what the code looks like for both of those methods of creating objects. Over here, I've got a class called entity, which just has a string. Now this string is just simply a standard string. I've put a little using up here just to simplify this code a little bit so that we're not writing std string everywhere. I, I usually do this because I don't like using namespace std. I know a lot of you ask me why I don't like using namespace std. I'm gonna make a video on that very soon, so just wait for it. But basically we've got a class with one member, it's a string, and then we've got one constructor which doesn't take any parameters, another constructor which does take in a string as a parameter, and then we just set the name to whatever the parameter is. And then finally, we just have a simple getter for, for name. So I've just made like a little dummy class. Now let's try and create it in the main function. How do we do that? Well, the first option, which is creating it on the stack, is very, very simple. We basically type in the type of the class that we want to instantiate, then we hit the space bar, and then we give it a name. So I'm gonna call this entity. And that's all there is to it. Now, because we've written it like this, it's actually calling the default constructor, right? This code might look a little bit weird to you if you're coming from a language like C Sharp or Java. In fact, you might think this, this leads to something called a null pointer exception or a null reference exception, because it appears like we just haven't initialized our object, but we have. Right? As long as we have this default constructor here, this is totally valid code. We can now call entity.getName, and what we'll actually get is, well, well, we'll get the name. We'll get unknown in this case because that's what the default constructor did. So let's print this out to the console and see what we get. There we have it, unknown. Because what we've done here is actually different to what this code would have done in Java or C Sharp, and we'll kind of we'll kind of get there in a minute. If we wanted to specify a parameter, all we need to do is just open up parentheses and give a name, such as Cherno. You can also do it this way. We can write equals and then the type. That's our constructor. Done. Right. And if we hit our five to run our program, we get Cherno this time and everything's great. So what's the deal with this? When do we want to create our objects like this? The answer is pretty much all the time. If you can create an object like this, 
do create an object like this. That's basically the rule because this is the fastest way in C++ and the most managed way in C++ to actually instantiate objects. Now let's talk about why, you, why there would be reasons where you can't do this. One of the reasons is if you actually want this to live outside of the life of this function. If we had another function over here and we created our entity over in that function, then as soon as we reach the end, as soon as we reach this, this, this end curly bracket, this entity gets destroyed from memory because what happens is when we call function, a stack frame gets created for this function which contains all of the local variables that we declare, which includes primitive types, but also our classes, our objects. And when this function ends, that stack frame gets destroyed, which means that all of the memory that we had on the stack, all of the variables we created are gone. So let's write some code that would actually fail. Scopes don't necessarily need to be functions. They could be if statements, for loops, or even empty scopes in which we just have curly brackets like this. If I create an entity pointer, now this is, this is basically a variable which points to an entity. Over here, I'm going to assign it to the memory address of our entity object that we've created on the stack right over here. I'm also going to simplify this because I usually write code that looks like this. I'm going to hit F9 on this line just to set a breakpoint and we'll, we'll inspect this. So right over here, we create a new entity object. Great, it's got the name Cherno, everything's great. I'm gonna hit F10 to move down. You can see that we've now set our E pointer, right? So if we hover over E, it is in fact pointing to this correct memory address and the name is Cherno, that's great. However, if we hit F10 again, and we advance to this line and then maybe the next line, and we hover over E, look at that. It's still pointing to that same address, but the name is gone because that object was, was freed, it was destroyed, it's gone. This Cherno entity doesn't exist anymore. We've reached the end of the stack frame, it's gone. That's the end of Cherno. That's the end of that Cherno. Go on, I'm still here though. That's good, right? So if we wanted this Cherno to somehow live outside the scope, we couldn't allocate it on the stack. We would have to resort to heap allocation. The other reason why we might not want to or be able to allocate on the stack is because if the size of this entity is actually too large, or we maybe have too many entities, we might not have enough room to actually allocate on the stack because the stack is usually quite small. It's usually one megabyte, two megabytes. It kind of depends on your platform and your compiler. But if, if you have this giant class, or you want to have a thousand of these classes, you might not have enough room on the stack. So you might have to allocate on the heap. Let's take a look at what heap allocations look like. So if we wanted to convert this code here to actually allocate on the heap, what we would do is we would first of all need to change the type. The type is now no longer entity. The type is an entity pointer. And what we assign to entity here is new, entity. Now the biggest difference here is actually not the pointer, which a lot of people notice, it's the new keyword. The new keyword is key and there's going to be a video on that new keyword very soon, maybe even tomorrow, we'll see. And when we call new entity, what actually happens is we allocate memory on the heap, we call the constructor, and this new entity actually returns an entity pointer. It returns the location on the heap where this entity has actually been allocated, which is why we have to assign this to an entity pointer. And this, this is where you people who know Java and C Sharp, this is, this is what the code actually looks like. In Java or C Sharp, you would be writing code like this. So usually when you come to C++, your instinct would be probably just to change the type and suddenly, yeah, this matches Java code and C Sharp code. And you're right, it does match Java and C Sharp code. We just have an extra option in C++, so we can allocate on the stack. You can't actually do that in Java or C Sharp. In C Sharp, you can, in C Sharp, there's something called a struct and that's a value-based type. And so that actually is kind of allocated on the, on the stack, even though you use the new keyword. But in Java, everything's on the heap. And in C Sharp, all classes are on the heap. The struct keyword is a bit different than it is in C++. And one of the biggest problems that I see is that everyone who comes over from a managed language like Java or C Sharp just uses the new keyword everywhere in C++. And you shouldn't be doing that for two reasons. And those reasons we're gonna talk about in that new video, because this video is gonna be huge if I talk about absolutely everything. But to cut it short, performance, allocating on the heap takes longer than allocating on the stack. And also when you allocate on the heap, you have to manually free that memory that you've allocated. So once we do something like this in our C++ code, we are actually responsible for freeing that memory. C++ is not going to suddenly decide, okay, you're done with this entity object. It doesn't know that we're done with it. We have to tell it this memory is free. And the way that we do that is we call delete and then 
the variable name. So delete entity. If you use the new keyword, you use the delete keyword to clean up after yourself. That is how C++ works. So in our example, since we do have to actually call delete to free this object, if we were to move delete down over here, maybe even after this cn.get, we're assigning this entity onto E, so we'll get rid of this ampersand, we don't need it since entity is already a pointer. And since entity is a pointer, we actually have to either dereference this first and then call get name, or we can use the arrow operator, which does that for us. We're gonna have a video on the arrow operator soon. I'm getting tired of doing this, but yeah, more videos. And if we go down over here, we'll just change delete entity to be delete E. So this is what our code looks like now. We create an entity on the heap. We assign entity to this. We're not copying any data here. Really what we're doing is we're just storing the memory address of entity. We're not copying the actual entity object, just the memory address. And if I hit F5, we'll debug this. We'll hit F10. You can see that E gets set correctly. We have our name Cherno. I'll hit F10 again. I'll go to, I'll go to the scene.get. I'll hover my mouse over E and you can see it still has the name Cherno right? Because it only gets deleted, it only gets freed here. And those are the two ways that we can create objects in C++. And choosing between the two is a matter of, is my object really, really, really big? Or do I want to explicitly control the lifetime of my object? If you answered no to both of those questions, allocate on the stack, right? Create your object on the stack. It's way easier. It's automated. And it's faster. Whereas allocating on the heap requires you to manually call delete which can lead to memory leaks if you forget to call delete. I mean, it's a bit harder than just like forgetting. A lot of people think, well, how, how on earth can you forget to call delete if you call new? You can, you can miss it sometimes. It gets, it's get, it gets complicated as we'll, as, we'll, as we'll discover. You can also use something called a smart pointer. We're kind of gonna get to those eventually. Again, link in the, I don't even know. I'm getting really tired of doing this. I'm not gonna keep track of this, by the way. I'm gonna come back. It's not like I'm gonna come back to this video in a few months and be like, oh yeah, I better fill in all those cards. So just search my channel for those videos. If they're there, they're there. If they're not, they're not. But with smart pointers, we can actually kind of still allocate on the heap and still get that kind of size advantage but also have our objects be automatically deleted when either the pointer goes out of scope or maybe like in the case of shared pointers when there are no more references. We'll talk about all this memory stuff in the future. I don't wanna get into it right now, but if we're just talking about kind of primitive C++, two ways to make objects, stack and heap. Those are my reasons, create on the stack unless you absolutely can't. If you guys enjoyed this video, then you can hit that like button and you can support this series on patreon.com forward slash the channel. You'll get episodes early. Basically, as soon as I'm done editing, the episodes get released to all the patrons, which is pretty cool. You can also discuss and talk about what goes into these videos and make suggestions for new videos and all that fun stuff. And you also help support this series and make sure that I can keep making videos. Next time, I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about the new keyword. So that should be exciting. Definitely watch that video. It'll be in the haha, -ha, I'm, I'm done. Goodbye.